Good morning. Welcome. Come on in and have a, have a seat. We love having you here, worshiping together with you. Uh, welcome you here online, however you're joining us. We appreciate you being here. The upcoming opportunities, college and career. So I'm, I'm still in college and I have a career. So that, how do you narrow down a college career? What is that? Where, do, where is the cutoff for that? But if you feel you're young and you have the energy, uh, join for picnic outing, Overland Park, next Sunday. And also they're looking at a, uh, a weekend trip to Christ for me in Tahlequah. The Gosens were here uh, recently sharing their ministry, awesome ministry, and I just encourage you to be a part of that. Also, name tags are back. Yeah, I'm going to write mine in reverse, so when I look in the mirror, I remember what my name is. So uh, that would be good for me. Also, the Philippians Bible study is still going on. For women online, uh, there's still opportunity to join that. Please let us know. Um, and uh, love to have you join in that study. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, the script order will be Sunday, October 4th. Just a reminder. Thank you. Let's worship together. Amen. Let's stand and worship together this morning. Let's start with this uh, call to worship. Come, people of the risen King. Good morning. 
eyes to Him With steady arms of mercy reach To gather children in Rejoice, rejoice Let every tongue rejoice One heart, one voice The church of Christ rejoice Amen. Second verse. Rejoicing together this morning, call to worship is from Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you our potter. We are all works of your hands. Let's pray. Father God, we rejoice that you are the potter. Sometimes we want to mold ourselves in our image or the image of our culture and many other images. Lord, you created us in your image. Help us to remember that we are the clay and you are the potter. And we rejoice in that fact this morning. Thank you. We love you. In your name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and remain standing if you would. Let's continue singing. Um, this song, uh, you know, we don't really follow a, a, a traditional liturgy together, but if we did, I think this song would fall in the um, assurance of salvation a portion of the literature uh, of the liturgy. Um, I have a shelter when all my sins accuse me, though justice charges me with guilt. Your grace will not refuse me. Let's rejoice in that together this morning. All right, here we go. I have a shelter in the storm When troubles pour upon me Though fears are rising like a flood My soul can rest securely Oh Jesus, I will hide in you My place of peace and solace No trial is deeper that comforts all my sorrows. I have a shelter in the storm when all my sins accuse me. Oh, just 
Christ discharges me with guilt, your grace will not refuse me. Oh Jesus, I will hide in you, who bore my condemnation. I find my refuge in your wounds, for there I find salvation. a shelter in the storm when constant winds would break me for in my weakness I have learned your strength will not forsake me oh Jesus I will hide in you the one who bears my burdens with faithful that cannot fail you'll bring me home to him oh Jesus oh Jesus I will hide in you the one who bears my burdens with faithful hands that cannot fail you'll bring me home to
Amen. Please be seated. Somebody's happy. <laughs> Praise God. That's awesome. Um, and someone we've been praying for. She's doing really well. Praise God for that. Um, continue to pray for uh, Mari's family, having gone through the process of uh, saying goodbye uh, to her, her, <clears throat> her father. And um, continue to pray for those that we've got on here that are going through physical things, uh, some of them still in situations where they can't be with people very much or at all. And that's a hard place to be. Um, anyway, just want to lift those things up in prayer. Also, uh, Florina had an appendectomy, emergency appendectomy, on I think it was Thursday night or Friday night, and is home and doing well, but it was one of those like three o'clock in the morning kind of surgeries. So uh, pray for her as she recovers at home. And um, talk to, well, actually, Texted back and forth with Michael Businitz, and, and they are back in um, Chihuahua, but um, he still has some shortness of breath, but he's getting better. He feels like things are really improving for him. So anyway, I just want to bring you up to date on those things we've been praying for. Let's go ahead and move on to Corey and Bethany, who are now back in Mexico and gearing up. Parts of Mexico are still totally closed down or partially closed down. Parts of where they are are... Um, and uh, actually, go ahead and go to the next slide as well. Please, there we go. Jacob and Linda Wiebe are on the team and lead the team uh, that Corey and Bethany are on. And that team there, um, because of the restrictions of the state and the local government, they are able to meet at the camp. So at the camp, they're, they're having their church services and that kind of thing because they can do the distancing that they're supposed to. So as Corey and Bethany and get back into things there with the team and as the team that Jacob and Linda lead and Kara's on that team as well. Uh, just keep on praying that uh, God would use the ministries that have been going on. There's some amazing things that have happened down through the years in that area and it's Jacob and Linda and the people that they've brought into that ministry who are doing that. So continue to pray for them if you would. They've got some requests specifically on here for us to pray. Let's just take these things to the Lord. Lord, we do thank you that we can come to you in prayer uh, we thank you for the, the good things we're seeing as you've uh, answered in, in very positive ways uh, with Gracie's foot. We're thankful about that. We pray for the future that you would continue to cause what needs to happen to happen for her. Um, Lord, we think of those that are struggling with other kinds of things, other health issues here in our church family. Uh, for those that are still having to be isolated, Lord, we ask your strength and your encouragement uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, there wouldn't be any kind of infection that would come into those situations where people are trying to protect themselves from, from COVID. So we ask for that, if you would work in that way. Lord, we do want to commit uh, the missionaries we've just mentioned to you, and we thank you for each of them. Thank you for that team that's down there in Nuevo Ideal and all the people involved with that ministry. Uh, Lord, they're reaching into some difficult and hard places, and and reaching people who desperately need the gospel. And yet sometimes that, that's a hard person to work with and disciple because of the kind of lifestyle they've had. So give them wisdom as they work with people from the rehab center and others who desperately need to have their lives changed by the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of worshiping you. Thank you for the opportunity we can lift our voices. And thank you, Lord, that we have a chance to be together and to listen to your word and to learn from it. So we ask for you to work in us and through us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, what a beautiful hymn. Let's stand uh, one more time before we look into God's Word together. During this hymn, kids up to fifth grade, uh, you'll see the slide to head downstairs to Children's Church if your family would like. And of course, everyone is welcome to stick around here as well. Let's just sing a couple of verses of uh, this hymn together. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Do everything without complaining and arguing, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. It's going to be in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 18. And now, Lord God, we ask that uh, you would help us as we look into your word. Help us to understand what it was that you were guiding Paul as he wrote. Help us to understand what it is that it meant and what it still means as we look at these words and try to understand. And then more than that, try to put them into practice every day in our lives. So we ask that you would encourage and challenge and convict whatever needs to happen in each heart, Lord, that you would do that by your spirit and through your word. We ask in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, there's a little verse card. You'll be getting these from time to time. It's, it was in the bulletin. This is some verses from last week. I find many times that uh, even verses that I've memorized before... I have to go back and start relearning. And so right now I've been working on Lamentations and uh, it was part of what we talked about last week. So I have to put it in there. Feel free to take those and memorize those or just put them up where you can see them every day. I find uh, God's word really encouraging many times. <clears throat> um, let's go ahead and put that first one up there. Uh, has anybody ever felt like this? There's actually a mug with this on and my daughter has this. Good morning, if it is a good morning, which I doubt. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, Eeyore's one of my favorite characters in Winnie the Pooh, but if you're ever around someone that's like Eeyore for extended periods of time, they can kind of get on your nerves. Just saying. Anyway, uh, a few years ago, I had the privilege of uh, traveling to Quito, Ecuador, uh, to be part of a missions conference, and I was one of the people who was speaking and sharing from God's Word, and it was just amazing to be able to be there and be a part of all of that. 
And uh, at one point we were taking a trip and we were going by buses and there were people from all over South America that had come to this. And so uh, the, the bus uh, leader was saying, listen, what we're going to do is every 20, 30 minutes we're going to rotate so that you get to know everybody on the bus. And I didn't say anything, but down the side I'm going, oh, good. You know, not my favorite thing. But so anyway, I managed to get through a couple of the, of the rotations and actually enjoyed meeting some new people. And then she said it again, and, and I went, oh, man. And she looked at me directly and said, Mark, are you complaining? And I had a come to talk, come to Jesus talk right then in my mind, and I confessed, and I said, no, no, absolutely not. I'm, I'm on my way. But, you know, it, it made me remember that there have been times when I've led a group or something like that, and all it takes is one to start kind of complaining and grumbling and mumbling, and it kind of picks up a little bit, and all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of people who are dissatisfied, and it starts with many times with one person. And so it was a real good lesson for me to hear again and to just be called out and said, listen, it, are you really complaining? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, Paul writes to the, to the people in Philippi, and he touches, we'll get to that in just a few minutes, but he touches on that whole idea of grumbling and complaining. So we'll get there in just a few minutes. But now as we look at the context, as we jump into verse 12, um, it comes right out of the first few verses of the, of, the, of the chapter. Remember, he's telling them that they need to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. He says that in verse 5, and then he talks about how Jesus humbled himself and became a man, not just a man, became a servant or a bond servant, and that he humbled himself and went obediently to the cross. And so in that context, he's saying, you know, you, got, you guys need to remember that Jesus Christ himself was obedient unto death. And then verse 12, he says, therefore, for that very same reason, because Jesus was this way, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now more in my absence, continue. And so he, that flows right out of, they're saying, Jesus Christ obeyed, and so should you. That's the context that he brings right into verse 12. So that's what the therefore is for, is to remind us that there were some things coming previously and that the obedience in verse 12 is being linked back to you should be the same as Christ Jesus who also obeyed and was obedient unto death. So, dear friends, um, my brothers and sisters, and, and this is a very, very intimate term here. It's, it's a term of, of deep love. He, and in chapter 1, he said, I have you in my heart. He said, I long for you. So he says, dear friends, people whom I love, as you've always obeyed, you have always followed the instructions and the things that we've asked you to do. And he said, not even, not only just when I'm there, he said, I understand why you would do that if I'm there, but you have obeyed even when we've been gone. And so what he's saying is there's been a change and a difference in your lives. And when you were saved, you continued that obedience to God, even if there was nobody like me there to try to make you do what, you, what we wanted you to learn to do. He says, um, even in my absence, you've continued that. And then he goes on to say, continue to work out your salvation. Or, if you will, keep on living out your faith. Keep on doing the things that show that what you believed is actually changing your life. That's the kind of thought that Paul is trying to get across there. Continue to work out your salvation. It's the whole idea of obedience coming through in faith, and it's the whole idea of being intentional and purposeful in that obedience. So continue to work out your salvation. Now, the ESV actually takes it and translates it this way, work out your own salvation, and that phrase is a plural as well. And so there is a personal side to this, but there's also a corporate side. So it's almost as if Paul is saying to them, all of you together need to be working out your salvation. So that together you are obeying, together you are working these things out. And I came across a quote that I thought was, was helpful thinking through the whole idea of working out your salvation. They were to show outwardly what God had done inwardly. In other words, when we're saved and we become believers in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit takes up a residence in us, there should be a difference in us. There should be a difference in the way that we think and in the way that we speak and in the way that we act. So he says, 
Dear friends, just like you've obeyed in my presence, also in my absence, keep on working out your faith with fear and trembling. And the fear and trembling isn't scared to death. It's the sense of awe and reverence and respect. And this is God we're talking about, the one who sent his own son. So keep on working out your salvation in fear and trembling or with awe and reverence and respect towards God. So he says, keep on working out your fear, or keep on working out your salvation, for it is God who works in you because it is God. So he says, keep on working out your salvation. And then verse 13, because or for it is God who works in you. God is the one who's doing this. For it is God who works in you to will, giving the desire, and to act, giving the power to to move forward and do what needs to be done or, or to, to be obedient. So God is at work in us. He gives us the desire for something, and then he gives us the ability to do what he's given us the desire for. That's what Paul's saying here. He says, you know, you can work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You can keep on growing in the Lord because God himself is giving you the desire to do this and the ability to do this. And that's coming right out of verse 13. So it is... God who works in you to will and to act according to his, and this is the best part of this, according to his good purpose. So God is working in us. If we're saying, Lord, I want to grow. I want to keep on working out my salvation. I want it to keep on becoming more like your son, Jesus Christ. That's, that's what I want to see happen. And, and, and God is saying, that's great. That's what I want to see. So I'm going to work in you. I'm going to give you that desire, and I'm going to give you that ability keep on doing. And by the way, my plan and, and everything that I've got going for you is, is a good purpose. It is a good purpose. And it kind of reminds us of what he said in Romans eight twenty eight. Like all things together, God's working all things together for good of those who, are, who love him and are called according to his purpose. And there's some, some implications here. So let's go to, um, let's just look at verse 12. Um, and I've got in three translations here. <clears throat> Continue to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Now, the ESV says, work out your own. Work out your own salvation. And New Living <clears throat> says it a little differently. But it's, it's the point of what is trying to be, to be made here. Work hard to show the results of your salvation by obeying God. Which is what he's saying. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is giving you the desire and he's giving you the ability to live that truth out. Now, just some observations about the whole idea of working out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation does not mean that we are earning our salvation. It's not saying work for your salvation. It's saying very, very clearly work out your salvation. So we can't earn our salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is as you live this truth out, keep on doing that. Keep on working it out. So we can't earn our salvation by working it out. And by the way, if we aren't working out like we should be, and maybe we've slipped a little bit, doesn't mean that we are losing our salvation either. Okay, so be really clear on that. You work out your salvation that has nothing to do with earning or losing salvation. Down to the next point. Work out your salvation does not mean that we can do it for someone else. Okay? <clears throat> work out your own salvation is what the verse says. It means <clears throat> that I'm the one that's having this um, interaction with God and he's the one that's working in my life. I, I cannot do it for anybody else. I can encourage, I can challenge, but they have to live that part out their own salvation themselves. Third thing, it does not mean that we can finish and be all done and be amazingly perfect in this world. We can never get to a point in our lives as believers where we say, that's it, I've arrived. See, I, I'm good. We can't do that. No, well, we could, but it would be a lie. When we see the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will become like him. And then all of the issues that we've struggled with our whole lives are going to be gone and will be like him because we see him. So it's not going to be done. It's an ongoing process. Next one, work out your salvation is a part of daily obedience. 
It's Paul's way of saying, this is something that has to happen on a daily basis, that you are looking at and doing what God is putting before you to have done. And then the last one, it is a practical application of being saved. You are saved by grace through faith so that you can live out the truth that you have believed in your daily life. <clears throat> and in Ephesians, uh, Paul put it this way, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved. It's a one-time thing. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm saved. And he goes on to say, this is not your own doing. You didn't make this happen. You did not cause this to happen. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. It is the gift of God. And I think sometimes we forget what a precious gift salvation is. It is the gift of God. And oh, by the way, it's not as a result of works. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything to get it. <clears throat> Jesus offers salvation freely to everyone who believes it's a gift of God. So if you've never been through that process of thinking that through and saying, you know what, I, I want, I want that free gift. <clears throat> Let me just suggest to you that this is the time. All it takes is for you to say, Lord, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you are offering me this amazing gift. And I, I want to receive that gift. And at that point in time, God takes, and he takes us from death and he brings us over to life. So Paul says what he said in <clears throat> Philippians to the Ephesians. You know, you've been saved by grace and it's by faith and it's not because of any works that you've done. But he goes on in verse 10 to say this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, so that's, that's a critical part that we need to remember. We're not saved by good works, but we are to continue doing good works. We are to do good works because God saved us for that purpose. And that's what Paul's saying when he says, work out your salvation. He's basically saying, there are good works which God prepared in advance for you. Do those things. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand <clears throat> so that we could walk in them. Now that word <clears throat> created is used only of God in, in the scriptures. So when he says you were his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, he's saying something really unique and really precious. And I think what he's saying there is, is that when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, at that point in time, something mystical happens and we are in Christ. We are created in Christ in a way that, that <clears throat> people write about and talk about and study, and yet there's a mystic part to this that we have to take by faith. It's right there. We are his workmanship created in Christ, um, and we're created for a purpose, and that purpose is to do those good works which he's prepared for us to do. So we show the reality of the faith that's in our hearts and in our lives by have, and when we're saved. And then the daily process of growing is that whole idea of working out your salvation. Working out your salvation is the process of growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. <clears throat> Carol and I met a young man named David in, um, in Bolivia when we were there many years ago. And David had been saved through the Luis Palau crusade. And um, he was part of the church plant that we were involved in helping with. And David was one of those amazing young men who, um, when, when God grabbed him, he grabbed him hard. And he didn't let go. And David is one of those guys who, you know, he went from being whole, I mean, just totally into the world in every way you could possibly imagine to being totally into the Lord and leaving all that behind. It was just one of those really cool things to see. And in the, in the process, um, you know, he was the first one saved in his family. And then over the years, various ones came to know Christ, also co-workers, friends, neighbors, all, all were brought to Christ because of David. And um, his mother, who was, in, was in, in, um, <clears throat> part of a, a very traditionalist religion that she was raised in herself, 
said, well, you know what? I, this isn't for me, but it's really good for my son because it changed him from a drunk to someone who is a good man. And so she saw the benefit and the value of what the gospel had done for him, but it, it, it wasn't for her. Um, and, and, and one of the things that really struck me in all of this is that the radical change in David happened because he said, Lord, yeah, what do you want to do with me? Do whatever it is. Um, David wasn't perfect. Uh, David um, had a lot of things that he had to learn and work on. And, um, and David is still today uh, living and working in, in ministry uh, in another part of Bolivia. He's been a pastor, he's been a church planner, and now he's in charge of a ministry to, to underprivileged and under, underdeveloped families in a very difficult setting in Cochabamba, Bolivia, uh, and been overseeing and building that ministry up and doing an amazing job. Second implication, um, again, I want to look at verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> Paul said, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Um, and, and, you know, I'm so thankful that that isn't the only verse there. Can you imagine the pressure and the weight on us if that was it? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and we didn't have verse 13? It would be, I guess it's up to me. I'm the one who has to do it. I have to make it happen. And that's why I'm glad it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. It is God who does the work. As we just saw in Ephesians, we are saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. And that's one of those things. If, if the two verses weren't together, we'd be, we'd be a mess. Because it would be us working hard to try to make it all happen. Us working hard so that somehow we could achieve whatever it is we think we have to achieve in order to be received into heaven. And, and the only thing that receives us into heaven is the fact that we've come through the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And so you've got verse 12 with this amazing thing. You need to continue living out the truth of your salvation. And verse 13 saying, and not only do you have to continue living it out, but God is going to work in you so that you can. And I think that to me is really encouraging because on the one hand, I know there's so many things that I need to learn and grow. And this week I'm saying, Lord, I, I have so far to go still. And he said, yeah, you do. <laughs> But you know what? The cool thing is, I don't have to do it alone. I go with him. He walks with me. Let's go on to verse 13 and a couple of translations different here. The one who is bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort is God. He's the one that gives us that longing and that desire and then gives us the ability. What an incredible thing. And in and, and, and the New Living, it says, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So when Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, thankfully, verse 13 is also there, which says, but you don't have to do this alone. The Holy Spirit of God is working in you so that you can learn what God wants and you can walk that out in your everyday life. So verse 13 tells us how to work out our salvation and, and how to keep on going. And, and so how do you do that? Well, you work harder. You, you work really into being more disciplined. You plan better. No, it isn't about me doing more. It's about me saying to the Lord God, I can't do this without you. I want to step forward, but you need to show me the direction. And then you walk with me because I cannot do this alone. I don't care what it is in the Christian life. If we are going to do it in our own strength and power, it's not going to happen. It'll be a mess because we mess things up. The one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort is God. I love that. This quote I found helpful, helpful as well. Both divine enablement and human responsibility are involved in getting God's work done. Believers are partners with God, laboring together with him. Um, God could have chosen all kinds of ways to spread the gospel. He chose us. He chose us. He wanted us to take the message of the gospel and let it change us 
from the inside out, and then for us to go out and share that with other people. And that's the whole process that God is doing. I'm going to go back to David, the man I was telling you about in the first illustration. He sat down one time and he told me, he said, Mark, when I first got saved, <clears throat> I was so excited and I wanted all my family to come to Christ. And, and I came home and I was so, uh, I, 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 he said, I'm very forceful. He said, I, I was trying to force them to come to where I had gotten to. And, and he said, I would come home and, and, and the tradition that his family had believed, there were statues and icons and all kinds of things around the room. And he'd sweep those things off the shelves and throw them in the trash and wasn't very helpful. It just didn't encourage anybody in the family at all. And he said, I finally understood that wasn't going to change anybody. And I was making people mad, and that wasn't what I wanted. And so he said, I just decided to keep on living, keep on being who God called me to be. <clears throat> and over the years, as I said, even his mother came to Christ, everybody in the family. And, and that's, uh, man, it was like six or seven brothers and husbands and wives and the whole bit. And it was just one of those amazing things. Because one man was willing to say, okay, God, I want to grow. So you need to work with me. Help me to walk out my salvation and work it out on a daily basis in such a way that even my family wants it. And praise God, that's exactly what happened. And he... He's still there today, continuing to work out his salvation on a daily basis. David learned that you can't share your faith without God, and he learned that it is God who works in you, giving you the desire and the ability both. And so David was learning those lessons very early and has continued to see God use those amazing things in his life. Let's go on to verse 14. <clears throat> This is one of those verses that uh, I think my mom used to pull out every now and then and just quote at me. <clears throat> I'd like to say it was really helpful, but uh, anyway. Verse 14 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. Why? So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. So do everything without complaining and arguing. The whole idea of murmuring and quarreling. Um, it, it, and, and I think what Paul is saying to the Philippians, and this is a church he loves and knows really well. A church that is going through some hard things and still being faithful. And yet there's apparently this undercurrent that's going on. So he says, do everything without complaining and arguing. Don't, don't argue about these things. We're going to get later into the, into the book and we'll find out that there's a couple of women that are at each other all the time. And Paul says, you need to help these ladies get along. But here he introduces it. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Uh, on one level, I think what Paul is saying is, listen, we were called to serve God, and, and we're not to call to serve him out of a negative and rebellious nature. That's not what God wants to see from us. So do everything without complaining and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure. He said, I want to be able to know that you are living innocent, clean lives and humility and kindness. Uh, children of God without fault. And, and, and what he's saying here is not that they're perfect, but that, that there isn't any glaring thing going on uh, like there was in Corinth and some other places where people looked at the Christians and said, man, they're terrible. Paul says, no, I want there to be not, none of that kind of stuff going on. Not perfect, not sinless, but good and with the goal of honoring Christ as you live each day. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. You know, sometimes we look around us and we think, man, it is terrible. And it's getting worse in our culture. And I wouldn't argue with you. But I think we forget how bad it was when Paul lived, too. There's some, if you just read a little bit of what, about what the world was like in that time frame, there's some pretty awful things. Matter of fact, uh, Philip's translation translated depraved, crooked and depraved as warped and diseased. So he's saying, hey, 
Live as children without fault in a warped and diseased world in which you shine like stars in the universe. And here's that contrast that Paul's making. You've got this dark, warped, diseased world, and you're supposed to shine out like bright stars in the black night. So that's what you need to be like. What a great comparison. He says, you're to shine and be as conspicuous with the light that you're shining as the actual stars are in a black night. So that's, that's the way it should be. And so you're living in a depraved and in a crooked and warped generation and, and world. That's okay. Your job isn't to go along with the world. Your job is to shine brightly into it like stars in the universe. Verse 16 says, as you hold out the word of life, and hold out is a better translated hold fast. So as you hold fast and keep hanging on firmly to the gospel, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. So you're reading this, you're like, was Paul trying to boast about the fact that he, you know, helped start the church in Philippi? I don't think so. I think what Paul is trying to say here is, you know what, you guys are part of the answer of a prophecy about me, that I was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. The fact that you exist as a church is proof that God made good on that promise. And it's you guys. I'm thrilled for you guys. No, I don't want to brag about this, but I, I want to be able to say it wasn't in vain. It all happened because of what God did through you. And so... He says, I, as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast that I did not run or labor in vain. Then he goes on to say, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you. Now, there's a bunch of imagery that Paul uses here. Uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament especially, there would be uh, animal sacrifices. And many times an animal sacrifice was accompanied by a drink offering. And the way that would work is this. The animal would be slaughtered and then placed on the altar to burn portions of it or sometimes all of it. And then the drink offering would be poured out on the altar or on the offering itself. And, and the imagery was that it would turn to steam and begin to rise up. And it would be symbolic of the prayers and worship rising to God and, and the fact that this is being offered to him in the way that he had asked them to do it. So what Paul's saying here is the way that you guys are living and, and your sacrificial way that you have given to me in the ministry, all of those things are a sacrifice. And I'm the drink offering being poured on the sacrifice. That's the imagery that he's using. So he says, you guys are the guys that are the sacrifice. You guys have done all these things. You're living through hard and difficult times, and you still maintain the, your faith in the church there. And he says, if I die, because that's kind of what he's thinking here, if I go to my death, then all I will be is like the drink offering poured on, on your sacrifice, which is all that you are doing as you continue to love and honor and serve God. And he says, either way, I rejoice. I rejoice in this. And he says to them, then, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, just <clears throat> a couple of implications as we end this morning. <clears throat> Paul says in verse 15, Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Um, shine like bright lights, or the other translations, shine like stars in the universe. So stop and think about that. We are, we are supposed to be lights in the dark, however imagery you want to you see that with. Um, we have a, a warped, diseased, broken world full of broken and hurting people. And there's a darkness in that. And yet we are supposed to shine into that darkness. We're supposed to be like the stars in the sky, which, by the way, provide light and provide direction. And I was studying this this week. The question that came to my mind is, how much am I like the crooked and perverse generation? Are there ways that I, that's who I am? And I put it kind of together in this way. How much do I look like, sound like, and act like the crooked and perverse world all around me. 
It's a good question to ask, isn't it? How much am I like that? I think there are times when we need to stop and say, Lord God, look at me. Look at my heart. Show me. God calls us to be pure and uncontaminated light givers in a sick and dying world. That's what we're called to be, light givers. And Peter said this, 1 Peter 2.12, Live such good lives among the pagans, and that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits, visits us. This is Peter's way of saying, listen, <clears throat> you're living in a depraved generation. You're living in a warped and dark culture, and you need to live with God's grace and God's strength and God's ability the best you possibly can. Perfect? No, absolutely not. But certainly live in such a way that the people who may actually make fun of you or may actually make fun of, of, of Christ and, and religion would say, oh yeah, but whatever it is they've got, I like that. Whatever it is that's going on in their lives, that, that's a good thing. I, I see how they speak to their children. I see how they speak to their spouse. I see how they interact with neighbors. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something here that, <clears throat> and I want, I want to see it right up front. This came out of conviction for me, okay, out of conviction of my heart. And I'm not trying to make any kind of point here, political or any other way. So please hear that up front before I start uh, telling the story. But um, <clears throat> you probably have some too. But I have, I have Christian friends who are very, very strongly, have very strong feelings about these things. Which, by the way, make really great beanies, uh, beard warmers. Just kidding. <clears throat> there are Christians who, I mean, Christians that I know and whom I love, who say, "I don't understand why everybody doesn't just wear a mask." It's, and then they go on from there. On the other side of the coin, I have people who I love and respect, or believers, who say, "You know what? And it's not useful. It's not helpful. I don't know why we should have to do it." And and so you get this both sides of this thing, and. And uh, many times I'm in, kind of sitting there going, okay, I, what do I do? And I have to be honest, I don't like wearing masks. It's annoying. My glasses steam up. My face gets all warm. I don't like it. I just don't. And so I have to be honest. There have been times my attitude as I reached for the dumb mask on the dashboard was not very good. And those times when I walked into the store without it and had to go all the way back out to the parking lot to get the mask and put it on, I was really upset. And as I, as I thought that through this week, I thought to myself, what does it look like to be a light? I'm not saying wearing a mask or not wearing a mask is about light. I'm saying for me and my heart attitude about all of it, that had to change. For me, I had to say, okay, if I'm going to wear this, I need to wear it in such a way that everybody I talk to doesn't think I'm going to bite their head off. Okay? So again, I'm not, I'm not making a statement about whether anybody in the room should wear it or not wear it. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. For me... It was a sense of my heart that needed to be dealt with. And so now, I'm trying to make it a practice that when I forget the mask and I have to go back out to the truck and get it, I kind of grumble on the way out, but on the way in, I start praying and say, Lord God, help me to be a blessing to somebody. Okay? Again, this is my struggle. I'm not trying to tell anybody to wear or not wear. To wear or not to wear, that's with you and your conscience and God. I, and I'm also not speaking about it in a medical way at all. I'm not a doctor, and I know doctors on both sides of this thing. And, and I just, I just want to say, it's about my heart. And if I want to be like the stars in the universe, my heart has to be right in this. My heart needs to be right. Whether I wear it or not, my heart needs to be right. I know this is highly personal. And it 
maybe something that you've had to struggle through and work through. Let me just place it out there. Take it to the Lord. Talk to him about it. And then do what God lays on your conscience in regard to that issue. Uh, Some verses that I found really helpful when I'm dealing with my own heart, with my own attitude. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. This is a great prayer. And we can, you know, Lord, I don't, I don't know if my heart is right, Lord. I don't know if there's stuff going on in there that, that is just a mess and causing problems. But please, would you search me? Search my heart. Know me. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts, those things that cause fear. This is critical. Point out anything in me that offends you. Is my attitude and my heart offensive to God? That's critical. That's so important. If I really want to live for Christ, it's search me. Work on me. Is there anything there, Lord, that I'm doing or saying? or Is is my attitude towards others coming out in ways that, that isn't light at all? God, help me. Show me. Make it clear. Show me if there's anything offensive and then please guide me help me to live out the truth because we are called to reflect the glory of God's character in our conduct our attitudes and our words that's our calling and when we do shine into the darkness we show the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that's why we're here now just what do we take away from all this Let's go back to the verse I hate. <clears throat> verse 14. Uh, do everything without complaining or arguing. Why? So that you can be a shining light in the sky. You can be like the universe of stars. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that that can happen. Do everything ouch what's included in that lord i mean you know is there any wiggle room you know everything lord really everything without complaining or arguing but lord you know i hate standing in lines do everything without complaining lord i hate this dumb mask do everything without complaint so that you can be lights like the stars in the universe If we want to shine like stars in the universe, giving direction and light to others, then we have got to make sure that we are not grumblers and arguers, whiners and complainers. Eeyore's cute on a mug, but you don't want to be Eeyore. People of Israel had a problem with uh, grumbling and complaining. Go back and read through Exodus and some of the other books in the Pentateuch. And um, I'll just give you three of them. Not too long after they'd gone through the Red Sea, Exodus 15, 24. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And miraculously, God provided. And then a few chapters later, in chapter 16, verse 2, uh, they traveled a little bit. And again, the whole community grumbled. And um, it was against Moses and Aaron this time. Then again, God takes care of the situation. And then in chapter 17, they traveled further. But the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you ever bring us out of Egypt? It was so wonderful there it was great life was awesome why did you bring us out here and we're never like that right we, we would never complain and grumble I find um, these verses very encouraging from Colossians 3 if you've got 
something that you're thinking about or something that you kind of always kind of bubbles up as a complaint or something. Maybe you don't even say it, but it's just kind of rumbling around. I love verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Be thankful. I don't know what it takes exactly to always have 24 hours a day the peace of Christ ruling in my heart, but I can tell you what doesn't happen. It doesn't happen when I'm grumbling, whining, and complaining. Let the peace of Christ rule. And so if there's stuff coming up, I need to say, Lord God, I, I want that peace, and I want it to rule in my heart, not... not the things I'm complaining about or things that I don't want to do or people I don't want to see. Lord, peace. I want your peace to rule. Thank you. Thank you for the the encouragement. Thank you for your help. Verse 16. Let the peace of Christ rule. Then let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts again so let the peace of christ rule let the word of christ dwell in you take it in think about it pray about it ask god to help you understand it even more and ask god to help you practice it the peace of christ rule in your heart let the word of christ dwell in you and then verse 17 whatever you do whether word or deed Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And then whatever you do, word or deed, it's not about complaining and arguing. It's about saying, God, I want to do it for you. I want to do it in your name. I want to dedicate this, whatever it is that's happening, to you. Thank you for that privilege and that opportunity. It's kind of hard to grumble and complain when you are overwhelmed with thankfulness. It really is. So may we continue to work out our salvation, trusting God to work in us, giving us the desire and the ability to obey him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the challenge. And Lord, I pray for every single one of us that as we get up and talk with each other and as we interact, that we would be reflecting who you are. And as we leave these doors and go all kinds of different places, again, Lord, may we be reflecting who you are to everyone we meet. Lord, thank you for the gospel that has changed our hearts and our lives. Thank you for your death, which made it possible. We worship you today. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand uh, one more time and respond with this hymn as we close. Let's commit ourselves together to the Lord this week. Everything that's on our, our minds, everything from our minor inconveniences to uh, our, our deepest fears and struggles. Let's commit ourselves to the Lord with this song.
of your Son here on earth. God, help us to work out our salvation. Thank you that we don't have to work in our salvation. Lord, help us to be salt and light shining in a dark world this week, Lord. As we go from here, Lord, help us to remember that darkness cannot exist in the presence of light. You say you are the light of the world God, this week, shine in and through us. In your name, amen.